Hello and welcome to Who Corner to Corner podcast. Uh, my name is Jeff. I'm one of your hosts, and as always, I'm joined by my good friend and co-host Paul. Hi, that's me. Hello there. How are you today? Yeah, I'm. I'm very good, thank you. Yes, I'm getting my face blasted by this really bright screen over here. So um, uh, I'm going to do something about that, just like that. That's so better. Just tech, turn the rest of it down a little wizardry. bit. That's what that is, mate. Yeah, I, yeah, I can yeah. still see you. Turn it down a bit. It's so funny. You make me yeah. laugh every day. <laughs> <laughs> so we're not alone tonight. We we love it when we're not alone <laughs> we on the podcast. Not. We have company. <laughs> then, yeah, not one, but two guests tonight. Yeah. So. Uh, I'm going to go for this and see if I get it right. So we're joined by Peter Angular. At, at, oh, dear. <laughs> He's fallen at the first hurdle. I've fallen at the first hurdle. Angelides. I'm going to let you in. An- Angelides and Simon Guria. Is that right? It'll do. Yeah, it's good. It's a very good approximation. And thank you for trying. One, one out of two. <laughs> Thank you very much. So we're here tonight to get surnames wrong uh, and talk about... The Daily Doctor book, yes, uh, which you can you can see on the shelf behind Peter. Simon, have you got a copy to hand? And there, look at that, I'll just, <coughs> Paul. Um, I'm going to Photoshop you holding one. We only we only got sent one copy, yeah. oh, so. Let's do that. <laughs> <laughs> so, let's let's kick it off by talking about the new book. So it's out now, isn't it? Yes. Um, am I right there? Yes, it's been out since August. It is. Yes. It was launched at the end of last month. Oh, is it okay? I, I thought it was tag end of September, so okay, so it's been out a little while then. So tell us, tell us all about the book. What's it all about? I know, and Paul knows, but people <laughs> listening might not. Well, it's all about Doctor Who, um, and so each uh, each <laughs> good day start. of the year yeah. is um, we provide a quote from Doctor Who. We explain what that quote is, and then we try and suggest ways in which that quotation that episode can help you in your life. Uh, so kind of pointers, a bit of advice, things to try. Uh, that's the idea. So uh, there's at least one quote from every Doctor Who story over the last 60 years. Um, mm. And a few uh, uh, of the related shows. So there's a bit of Sarah Jane adventures in there. There's a few other bits and pieces. Um, but yeah, just just how Doctor Who can, can help you day-to-day in your life that's kind of the idea and there, there, there's quite a story behind each of the quotes it seemed because they, so when you say quotes it's like um it could be anything from like a line to like a paragraph right it's a, they could be quite chunky and then there's a whole bunch of the you know the kind of story behind them sort of mm. uh, like you said how you apply them to your life how you might think about these things in your ordinary day so where, 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 where do you make the how do you decide what's going to go in, in into into each of these well when Anyone we wants to take that yeah when, <laughs> when we when we started um the, yeah. the kind of the, the idea was that they that you know that you're kind of you have the idea for the book and what's going to work and then you've kind of got to actually do the work of going through the episodes and trying to work out mm. what you can use and things and you don't want to use the same things again you don't want to come up with the same um, uh, uh, lessons or, or, or advice again. So um, you kind of work it out as you do. Or I, I don't know how, how Peter feels about this, but I, I kind of worked it out as I did it. And once I got a few under my mm. belt, I kind of knew how this was going to go. And you want a bit of variety. So, yes, some of them are longer, some of them are shorter. Mm. Um the longer they are, the less explanation you have to write afterwards because they've all got to fit on a single page. Um, so that's yeah. kind of <laughs> what I was thinking. Peter, how was it for you? Well, I thought it was nice to think about what are the things which are characteristic of each episode, but um, not to necessarily go for the obvious ones. So you're trying to be a bit novel about these things. There are some that you can't really miss out, so you, you can't really not do the daisiest daisy, for example. Mm. You don't want them all to be things which people are expecting. So when we were looking through the different episodes, you were looking for things which you thought might spin off a a thought. Mm. Um, Some of them are specific advice from the doctor, and some of them are things which just inspire a thought about uh, how you might go about your life. So how, how, um, how did you tackle this project how much doctor who did you have to watch to to do this <laughs> loads loads and loads oh there's never too much doctor who to watch it's always a great excuse <laughs> when when the I, publishers I came nice, to you and... nice... 
I was, just, I was going to say when the nice thing about doing research is the longer yeah. you do research, the the less time you spend worrying about what you're going to write. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the longer you defer the point at which you actually put your fingers to the keyboard. So and when the publishers. <laughs> this is going. Like, this, this is what happens if there's two. If there's like four of us on there, but I'm, I'm going to get one in here because yeah, you've yeah. had like a, like a, a lifetime to research, I guess, as bona fide Doctor Who fans that you both are, of course. Yes, this is what what we're. I think what you're skirting around is what my wife refers to as my wrong knowledge. That I know an, an <laughs> awful lot of Doctor Who stuff, actually. I feel yeah. it's not all in my head. What I've got is a room full mm. of Doctor Who stuff that I can go and check. Um, a bit like Peter, I've got bookshelves and bookshelves <laughs> festooned good, good with button. stuff. So, um, yeah, so I, I kind of had, yes, I, I certainly had a, a kind of head start on this sort of stuff. Actually, what you then find mm. is you've got to go back and double check everything anyway. Yes. Yeah. Yes, because you know that Doctor Who fans are going to be reading this, mm -hmm. um, and if you get something wrong, you're, you're going to get called out on it. So you <laughs> yeah. can rely on your memory of particular quotations from the series, but yeah. then you go, do you know, am I quite sure that's exactly how it is, or is that just how I've remembered it over all these years? And we the talked way I've been about, joking about um, it? yeah, we talked about similar, didn't we? What do they call it? The, man the Mandala effect, where people kind of misremember things you know and, and you go oh yeah you know this this is what happened like uh, mm. you know the cybermen coming out of the thames or something and you know that's not what, what happened at all of course but you know yes yeah, so like you're saying peter you, you think oh yeah i've got this quote and then actually you go and check it and realize yeah i got it wrong so <laughs> better better or, proof or all, the yeah. sort of the equivalent doctor equivalent of what they call mondegreens in in music where you misremember a lyric mm. in a particular way I don't, I've not heard of that word before. I've learned something yeah, tonight. Are, this is good. Now, now yeah. I know what's always happening to me. There'll be a the test at the I end. Get. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's just a daily thing now. You, it is. You get yeah. Older, yeah. It just, just happens now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, and then being the pedants that we are, hmm. we then needed to go back and say, well, that was how it was in the script, but how was it actually in the broadcast episode? And oh, yes. what, which, yeah. which is right. Uh, if mm. somebody stumbled over a line, then do you say, well let's do it exactly as they stumbled over the line, or do you say, well, the intention was this in the line, so mm. let's put that in the book. Yeah, there was definitely so, some I stuff about... With a, with a happy combination of the two. There was definitely some things where the grammar oh, and the, you know, where we were putting in commas and dashes, mm. there was a bit of going back to the original script to see how we transcribed some of the stuff. Um, I think there may even have been some stuff about names of monsters or props and things as well I, yeah I, there was definitely a bit of going over the old paperwork just because as peter yeah. said we're very pedantic and hopefully our readership is as well um <laughs> yeah well i would think yeah quite highly high chance of that yeah so did you have um you know a, a list of you know 300 plus you know kind of topics that you wanted to, to cover in this or did you you know generate them as you were watching back through episodes or sc scripting how you know how did you kind of come up with it all because it's it's really kind of broad ranging in in the stuff that it you, you know talks about isn't it yeah we actually start we approached it the other way around which is that we started with the episodes with the mm. stories so i one of the first things uh that happened once we had been given the go-ahead for this was I made a spreadsheet of story titles um, in order. Yes, I like that approach. And then every time I, every time we filled it, every time we completed an entry, we added a one to the next column related to that story. And that meant that we, A, kept a running total of how many we'd done, but also because that list was all the stories in order, we knew we were doing one per mm. story. And then once we got to the end of that, we could look at what, you know, how many entries we had left and how we were going to cater for that. So, so uh, actually this, mm. but Peter did more of that. The uh, I think, I think Peter did more of the, when we got to the stage of going, what else are we going to have there? You know, which, which stories deserve two quotes uh, from them and wh where else are we going to source things from? So, and, and actually that part of it, uh, 
Peter was more uh, mm. on. So, so Peter, how did you choose what to what to double up on? Mm-hmm. Yeah, did uh, you have I, any? I was uh, going heated... through a particular story, and I couldn't make my mind up about what I thought was a particular, <clears throat> uh, particularly compelling quotation. I had two or three, or in some cases four. <laughs> um, you know, I'm making a. Oh, I quite I quite like all of those, but we can't have four from one story. I think the yeah. most we've got is two, isn't it, from from particular so. stories. So I, I might have reluctantly said, well, we can't have that one. Mm. My also, my thought also was that as far as possible, you wanted it to be something the doctor had said or something that had been said to the doctor. Mm. Um, some of the episodes didn't necessarily lend themselves to that, but you wanted to be led by it, by the doctor as the central character, yeah, yeah. whatever he or she is saying in the particular episode. And that then guided me to uh, to winnow through the, uh, the options that I had. He was, I have to say, extremely useful that Simon came up with this spreadsheet. I'm a great fan of spreadsheets, <laughs> dull fellow that I am. So, uh, it Paul, comes to you, yeah, Paul, you are quite a spreadsheet fan as well, aren't you? You should because uh, because I, I have to be. I, I never grew up a spreadsheet fan, but they, they are complete anathema. But they, you cannot deny their usefulness for organising things that your brain cannot. So. <laughs> I saw Paul's eyes lighting up when the word spreadsheet passed from Simon's <laughs> yes. I love it. I love a good spreadsheet. My children yeah, beat me about my accountant. spreadsheet because if, I, if I'm writing something that you know, my, my children know I'm serious about it once I've got the spreadsheet organised yeah. oh, for you yeah. know, the number of words have... a chapter or the number of words that need writing with, within a particular period of time. I, have... but I think that sometimes they think I spend more time on the spreadsheet than I do on the writing. <laughs> I have a dis- well, it's, it's all in the prep, isn't it, really? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I also, I have, a, I have a disturbing number of Doctor Who spreadsheets of one sort yeah. and another. Um, oh, because <laughs> um, partly I do a, um, I do an infographics, a, a data related uh, column mm. for Doctor Who magazine every, every four weeks. So I'm constantly yeah. crunching numbers or trying yeah. to, mm. trying to work out how we can find some way in. Um, and then I was do, I was writing a thing earlier this year. And realised I was going to have to put all the, the sort of paperwork from the early 60s I had access to. I was going to have to compile it and put it in order just so I could get my own head around it. Um, and that's turned out to be quite useful for some other stuff. But yeah, it's uh, there was a time when, I, you know, the very idea of doing a spreadsheet yeah. would have uh, would have horrified yeah. me. And now it's quite a lot of my life. What, what have I become? I know. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, I mean, my my twenty. We're really spelling the, the the appeal of this uh, this book, aren't we? Sam, <laughs> by talking about spreadsheets. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it's the right thing just... read. Is what we want to say. They, they are important. I'll tell you for why. Because the amount of times I've seen uh, like a Doctor Who book or something on eBay, thinking, oh, "Brilliant! I'm going to pay." 10 quid 20 quid or whatever it is for that only to realize that i've already got it yeah right probably several times over yeah. and i paid like the original 5.99 or, or whatever it is so yeah spreadsheets are useful they can actually save you money kids yeah true fact right so, you know, yeah. sadly, some of us are old enough to remember when doctor who books cost 25p oh yes oh. yeah same well actually i think you know, my you know, first that's, one that's cost... four shillings in old money yeah. five shillings yeah. were they in black and white 35p brain and morbius <laughs> so funny. Yes, they're, they're all handwritten. They're all handwritten on slate. They're on slate. Yeah. Oh dear, we so, just. But, um, um, yeah, we are a bunch of oldies, I'm afraid. Yeah. <laughs> At least I am. Anyway. Well, uh, yeah, I'm nearly there. Yeah. So, yeah, um, fun, I, I guess there's enough qu- enough quotes that were not used that you could perhaps make a sequel to the oh. book. Uh, I'm not sure. There were one or two stories where you felt, mm. you know, there was, there was bags of stuff happening in the story, but was there a, a particularly compelling uh, quotation to come out of it? Um, I don't know. What do you feel, Simon? Because you, yeah, you did the I first think, pass. I, I think technically, yes, you could. But I think that's kind of... I think what this book does mm. is to give you a different way of engaging with Doctor Who, which is that it kind of... Mm. I don't know about you, Peter, but I find now watching Doctor Who since I've done the book, I'm kind of picking up on what you can draw from it and what can, what would be a practical application from elements of the story. I mean, as we say in our introduction, you know, there are elements of Doctor Who that are quite fun and interesting and the Doctor shows intelligence, mm. but they're dealing in things that don't relate to everyday life. You're not going to face a Tythonian... Yeah. 
uh, in a tunnel who mm. you know has lost the ability to communicate that's that's a less likely and thing to happen appendage exactly you know there <laughs> there are situations where i can see that might be quite useful um to know that that's a way mm. to make friends with people i don't know but we were kind of trying to go for more everyday stuff um yeah and that mm. kind of changes how you view Doctor Who and, and, and view particular stories. So I think um, one of the things that got talked about in the very early conversations mm. we had about this book is the thing about um, Sherlock Holmes stories is that Sherlock Holmes is continually encouraging Dr. Watson to apply those methods of deduction and abduction mm. uh, to work out what's going on. And Watson gets better more or less as a result of this and yeah. spots things and sometimes is ahead of the game and things and as a reader you are as well it kind of teaches you the how to deduce stuff and i kind of hope that this book does that for the reader as well that you kind of take that on and see these things as well so mm. there's no call for a second book because you're kind of already mm. doing that yourselves um and you know yeah, our next book yeah. should be about something else that's that's my feeling. Yeah, 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 yeah. that's yeah, fair enough. Yeah, yeah. Night, nightly doctor. Yeah. <laughs> doctor, night, yeah. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The dark, the darker side. Yeah. The darker side. But yeah. you know, I, I like it because sorry, Joe, I was just because because what what you're saying there and and what the book seems to um seems to propose is that or reminders is that the doctor's view on how to deal with conflict and how to resolve relate well not really resolving relationships probably fragmented relationships if anything but the doctor's outlook on life and the way they go about sorting stuff out is 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 a very hopeful and optimistic mm. kind of you know message isn't it? i mean when i when i first started getting into doctor who, i think one of the things that really attracted me was here's a hero who doesn't go in all fisticuffs guns blazing you know it's kind of the, the whole macho kind of uh, action hero sort of sort of style you know here's someone who who may have a dark side but we don't really see it it's more about mm -hmm. the light and the optimism and that would seem to me to to provide the, the perfect rationale behind behind the book that you guys put, put together so it's you know it, it kind of the book that you have reinforces that i i would mm. say yeah the, the book's very sort of positive uh, mm. you know kind of hopeful in positive you, you know, affirmations the, and by yeah. goodness we need them right now that's yes. for sure and you know the the like you were saying the you know you take a quote and then how you can apply the kind of sentiment of that to, to your everyday life and and i think it's offering you know kind of hopeful and optimistic you know ways of, of approaching life and that's kind of you know a bit like paul said how i kind of view the doctor overall is a hopeful joyful optimistic character and and the you know the show is essentially about being kind to people and helping people amongst you know the monsters and the mayhem and stuff like that but you know it's not every day you encounter that kind of thing like you're saying simon you know so i think uh you know taking those kind of core things and just trying to you know bring that into your own life a little bit is is very positive i don't i yeah i think i think the word i'd use rather than optimistic i don't know how peter feels about this but but actually mm. going through the process of doing this i think rather than op optimistic i would use the word practical the doctor is often okay. is, is quite a doer mm. so in in facing any problem yeah. or, or whatever the doctor's response is generally to get get active mm. and hands-on and not quite always proactive. yeah not always um in a way that <coughs> necessarily makes things better immediately um i was very mm. conscious because yeah. i started with um because of the way that we divided things up i started with a lot of the early stories so you know in <clears throat> in the original dalek story the doctor doesn't get his own way so sabotages the tardis and puts all his friends True. lives at risk mm. that was that's quite a tricky one to take a sort of positive thing from yeah so yeah so yeah. there's a certain amount of um yeah it, it, it's it's it was a it was a harder um it was a harder job than than just going through each story looking for mm. positive uplifting stuff it was much more about 
how can you make a difference? What what should your action be in these circumstances? That was more mm. the kind of uh, uh, Peter. How did did you find that as well? I mean, maybe that was just yeah. Me. I agree. It's the the doctor, the doctor isn't isn't passive. The doctor wants to be involved, and sometimes doesn't always mm. get it right. But there's a pragmatism about what the doctor does in in yeah, stories yeah. to to progress things, and not necessarily for for his or her own uh, own um, best needs. It could be for for others as well. Uh, sometimes it's inspiring point. others. Mm. Sometimes it's encouraging others. Sometimes it's explaining what's uh, what's going on. Yeah, I I I see where you're coming from actually. So in in mm. some ways. I mean, I, I, I guess we all get different things out of it, don't we? I'm kind of thinking the Ninth Doctor as well and the way that the Ninth Doctor kind of, kind of inspires people to be to, to rise up and be the hero. You know, he's not always the, the, the person who pulls the switch. You know, he'll convince somebody else that they can pull the switch, that it, you know, that, that it means something for them, that they can stand up and fight the Daleks, even if they're not going to particularly survive, the, survive it. So... Yeah, Inter interesting. Yeah, yeah that, I, I like that. It's a kind of a self help and inspiration. Yeah, there's a there's a good example of it's, uh, it's not completely black and white, is it? No, the, mm. I mean a good example that, that I tried to work into the book is the sequence in the Ark in Space where Sarah gets trapped yeah. in a tunnel, and the Doctor motivates her to get herself out of it by being yes. by being a bit yeah. rude to her and being a bit mean quite rude and she's mm -hmm. she's so mm -hmm. determined to prove him wrong that she gets herself out now on screen that yeah. works really well it's really difficult to make that the quotation and mm. explain the context and then find a lesson in it yeah um and i i, I struggled with the, i thought that would be a really good one you know oh, we were talking earlier about <laughs> my my sort of knowledge yeah. of Doctor Who, so I thought that's a good one. That's a bit different. That'll be a good one to do. Mm. And actually, trying to make that work on paper just didn't come across because it it just makes the Doctor sound like you know not very nice. Um, whereas in it's, the it's been a bully, basically. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Whereas it whereas watching it, that's not the that's not what you get at all. So so what happens is no, because you've got the context, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. and so so that mm -hmm. those kind of things change your perspective, and you see new things, you make new connections in what you're watching. Um, even though I know the Arkham space uh, really well, that that kind of gave me a new in mm -hmm. on it, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So, Peter, how, how did you guys um, divide the writing duties between you then? Did you just kind of go at it, or was there a, was there a, a plan? Yeah, you said, Simon, you did more of the earlier stuff. So, yeah, did you take it alternate doctors each, or, you know, yeah, how, how did you approach it? Uh, Simon did the, the, the first doctors, and mm. I did the ones towards the end, uh, just because that was the way it, it happened to pan out. Which doesn't mean to say that I didn't do any of the earlier doctors, because sometimes you went back and and tried to come up with some uh, some duplicates. Um, so when you know because there there aren't three hundred and sixty five uh, individual stories. Mm. And I did some of the later ones. So how how far did you get, Simon? Did you get did you get halfway through, Tenant or I think like so. I did. So when we began, I did a selection. Yeah. So a few people had chipped in idea so so the idea that the book was originated um by steve tribe and so he'd written some entries that i inherited mm. um i think i can't remember how many of his were used in the end it was sort of five or six i think um i there was an entry written by matthew sweet that didn't work the, didn't fit the format as it became so i reworked that right and yeah. then they wanted to see early on a kind of um, this is how it will work in a random order. So I did sort of whatever it was. I took the Steve ones, I took the Matthew one and I added a few of my own and kind of had a so we had a yeah. random <coughs> pat pattern of them. And once I'd done that, then I put the yeah. spreadsheet together, ticked those off on the spreadsheet and then worked through it in order. Mm. And I think I got to gridlock, I think. I think right. that's where we'd handed mm. over. So series three, yeah. But you'd also picked up some of your favourites from later Doctors as well. Yeah, yeah. So, it, and and I think I'd missed I think, some. I, I think you did. I think you did the first Jodie Whittaker story, for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it was. Um, 
I mean, because I, I think I started just by going, what can I think of? Yeah. And then I realised I need to, we needed to be more orderly about that because otherwise we were going to repeat ourselves and yeah. Yeah. and and especially sharing the project and and things that that wasn't going to work. So yeah, it was um, yeah. Well, so yeah, it was a bit chaotic to begin with, and then there was a bit of structure to it. Mm. Yeah, yeah. But stylistically, you don't want it to read like it's written by two different people. You want it to be. Uh, be consistent without being foolishly consistent throughout. Yeah. Uh, and one of the nice things that our editor Steve um, said uh, at the end was that um, you couldn't tell the difference. Yes, I, I think he meant that as a compliment. Yeah. Didn't he yeah, say? Yes, just say, yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah. In this case, yeah, yeah. So, how long have you been work, well, were you working? Both as good as each other is what he was saying, yes, right? That's yeah. what you mean. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So uh, yeah, how long were you working on the book? You know, b between you uh, b before it came out, because it must be, must have been quite an undertaking. Yeah, I think there was a bit that the there was a <clears throat> the early stages are all a bit. You know, can you sit on a meeting for half an hour? Can you sit on on a mm. chat? Um, so there was a bit of that. Yeah, once yeah. once we actually got going, I think it was about. Six, eight weeks, something of that. Does so, that tally with you, Peter? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, and also, yeah, as I've said, because I'm obsessed with spreadsheets. <laughs> oh no, he's talking about spreadsheets yes. again. Uh, I, I had a spreadsheet which said if I'm going to have to meet the deadline for submitting this first this first draft, <laughs> and I've got to write this many uh, entries, then I need to write this many per day. And today I've written this many, and yeah. my spreadsheet then extrapolated how many days I was going to have left, and whether I was on time, or whether I could have a day off. <laughs> so uh, yeah, That's about so... six weeks is probably about right. I, so I thought awesome, you were going. Yeah, I thought you were going to say it took like a year to, you know, to go through everything and, you know, watch stuff. And uh, that's that's impressive. Jeff, to, you would take you know. a year to do it. I oh, know you would. And it would well, yeah. be the last two weeks that anything actually got done. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. Well, I, you know, I don't. Uh, I mean, it, it, this is where having. You saying something? Uh, this is where having a, a, a mm. knowledge of Doctor Who helps because you, you kind of have a rough idea what you can use yeah, for a yeah. story so you at least know where to look and you can kind of mm. skip to that mm. bit of the episode or look for particular things um so you can so as long as you've got that kind of idea you uh you can get them mm. you can identify the quote and write the context bit that the, what's been happening in the story so far because you know the, the, the big thing is that you have to mm. assume that you know i'm aware that there are mm. viewers who don't know, who are, who are Doctor, fans of Doctor Who now, but who don't know the early stuff or, or particular periods of it. Yeah. And there are also fans of old Doctor Who who, you know, have only mm. seen more recent episodes once, you know, shockingly. Uh, so yeah. so they don't know the newer stuff. Oh. So, so you kind of need that explanation in to cover everybody. Mm. Um, where the time was taken was in working out what your take was going to be. Um, so what I'd find is I'd identify good quotes or, or things, mm. and then I might go off and do the washing up or, you know, do the school run or whatever. Yeah, and let, it, let it kind of spin. And then it'd be kind of like, right, I've worked out where I'm going to go with that. But also having done that, mm. I've also worked out another take for something else I can do. So I'd be kind of yeah, like, yeah. I'd be adding to the spreadsheet. Oh, this later episode, I could do something about X or I could do something about Y. So, yeah, yeah that was kind of how it's. But Peter, was that different for you? And you can also you can also make sure that you don't have to retell the entire story again. You just need to, to explain the context of what's happening in an interesting and compelling and preferably mm. amusing way as well, without explaining the entire backstory for, uh, yeah. you know, um, a six part yeah. story. Yeah, four pages of, uh, you know, episode recap before you get to the, yeah, yeah. You know, the point of yeah. There's the, a, the, the, the thing. I, I have, I've had training in this. So um, when we when we write for Big mm. Finish, you can assume that people listening to Big Finish listen from the start to the end yeah. and are probably listening on reasonably good kit so you can have stereo and stuff and you mm -hmm. so you don't need to explain everything all the time but if you're making drama yeah, or, it's like a shorthand that you can 
exactly. Mm-hmm. But but if you're if you're writing drama or documentaries for broadcast on radio, yeah, you have to remember that mm-hmm. some people are going to be coming in halfway through, or or you know, or ten minutes before the end. Um, and they might be what mm-hmm. what's referred to as listening with one ear, where they're doing something else at the same time, like driving mm-hmm. or washing up or whatever. So what you periodically have to do is kind of bring them up to speed. And that doesn't mean that you have to remind them of every, yeah. everything. You just have to tell them what's important now. And I used to do all mm-hmm. sorts of um, sort of exercises in this kind of thing when I was mentoring people about, about how you bring people up to speed. They don't need to know the whole story. They just need to know what's important for the next bit. Mm. Um, and there's a really yeah. good example of this in the James Bond film Spyfall where um, in the last bit of the film, there's a battle in a house and um, a new character comes in, uh, played by Albert Finney. And Albert Finney... Oh, the, the gamekeeper. Exactly, yeah. the gamekeeper. Clearly written to be played by Sean Connery, mm. um, who said no, sadly. Yeah. But Albert Finney turns to James Bond. <laughs> They're stocking up all their guns. And Albert Finney turns to him and says, um, yeah. so, so what's going on? And James Bond goes... There's some, yeah, that's it. there's some bad guys. They're going to try and kill us. The recap. We're yeah, going to kill them yeah. first, and that's all you need to know. That's it. Yeah. That's that's the whole first hour, or however exactly. much of the film has mm. gone by, summed up. That's all you need to know. And so that that's kind yeah, of the that, mentality. This is, this is where we are in the plot. Yeah, mm. and and so with these quotes, like that's yeah. of course that's that, Skyfall. That, that's a really good insight, Spyfall, Simon. Yeah, but... yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah, to that point about. Um, uh, what Big Finish does. We know that Big mm. Finish listeners uh, tend to be quite intensive listeners. So as Simon says, mm. they'll have their earphones on, they're very attentive. Uh, it's a more niche audience who are paying mm. attention, not just to what's happening in that particular episode, but how it relates to others. So when, I was, when I'm writing stuff there, I'm conscious that I can, if you like, get away with stuff because they're paying attention. Yeah. Mm. And what's more, they'll listen to it more than once. Mm. Whereas when I was writing something like uh, Pest Control for the BBC, yep. um, um, then I know that that's more likely to be the sort of thing that parents will stick into the CD in the car when they're yeah. driving their kids down the motorway to go and see their family. And, you know, they're not going to rewind stuff. Um, and there's, there's going to be distractions and there's going to be other things happening in the car. And so... Um, there needs to be a slightly more linear route through things with some mm. high points that they will spot. But you can't rely on that level of attention throughout the story. Yeah, that's interesting. And, and I've listened to uh, Pest Control and, and you know, various other ones in that range. And they are, they're very good, aren't they? But they are different to the Big Finish stuff. They're, they're mm. you know, simpler is not the right, you know, that's not being dismissive of it. But yeah, the, the Big Finish stuff, you're right, it's for people who are sitting down in the dark and listening to it and, and that's all they're doing and concentrating on it mm. and therefore you can do more with it can't you in in some ways yeah yeah so the the, yeah. the better you know the audience and there's also an expectation of that as well yeah yeah mm-hmm. and 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 the better you know your audience and what they're that kind of context within which they'll be engaging with what you're writing yeah. the better you can tailor what you're writing so i mean as yeah. again as we say yeah. in the introduction to our book peter and i don't know what's going on in our readers lives we don't know what problems or Mm. issues they may be facing we kind of have to guess that um yeah yeah and and what let what level do you play that at do you play that as you're going through a crisis or do you play that at as you know just daily hints and tips and i think we've we kind of settled on much more daily hints and tips but with a sense that, mm. that that's that's what it feels like, yeah. That that every now and again you face a bigger yeah. challenge. Yeah, and also we need to be aware that not all of our readers have the same situations as well. Mm. So one of the good notes that we got from our editor Steve mm. um, was uh, occasionally I would write something about you know because I'm a parent, so I'm thinking about what it's like to be a parent, yeah, my experience yeah. of having raised children with my wife and so on. But Steve said, you know, not everyone who's reading this will have children. Mm. either because they're not at the stage of their life where they have children or because they've chosen not Mm. to have children so Mm. if you're writing it and you're addressing it to somebody as a parent you're addressing it you know you're you're excluding some of the readers yeah so there were there were some very useful notes from steve about how to not not to not talk about raising children for example but to reflect that the person you're talking to might not have that personal experience in their life so is is it about kind of finding that voice then yeah 
Because you, know, you don't have to be a parent to know people mm. who have raised children, for example. It's just the way in which you happen to express it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's a good point. So, uh, from the whole book, do you each have a favourite, uh, you know, quote and, and kind of a bit of advice? And, and which doctor did it come from? Ooh. I a mm. if, if you if you're not watching, or there, there's, there's, such, there's such a range because it, it mm. the pieces of advice range from things as profound as how you handle grief mm. yeah. to how best to pack when you're going on holiday. <laughs> so to choose one suggests that it's more important than than some of the others. There, yeah. there, um, there are, I think, it's, uh, and there was some when as I was writing them, I thought you know, this is mm. this is. Um, this is quite uh, profound uh, as a story, but I don't want to trivialise it with the piece of advice I give mm. uh, at, at, as part of the sort of the, the learning point from it. Um, <clears throat> so, um, but you know, I, there, there were there were some some fun ones. I quite like the one that I wrote for um, Time Heist, which is <laughs> essentially about how to handle spam calls. <laughs> you know, that sounds like a really <laughs> trivial thing. You know, you might not think that's the characteristic of that particular story, yeah. but it was the thing that sprang to mind as a fun thing to do. Yeah, and and also very, uh, you know, um, you know, relevant to today's life with you know, those yeah. calls. Yeah, yeah. Whereas in contrast, I also really like writing uh, the the um, the, um, the, mm. the Vincent Van Gogh um, uh, um, piece of advice, yeah. which is which is. You know, it's about about uh, death by suicide, mm. um, and that's that's something you want to make sure that you are you are treating um, tactfully, and not not in the space of a one page piece of advice, <clears throat> sounding really trivial. Mm. Yeah, quite right. Yeah. Uh, and and I spent probably more time on that one, thinking you know, what is the right tone to use, what is a piece of advice, and I didn't want to shy away from that as the as the subject of that particular. Um, episode because to write something about you know here's here's how to do painting nicely about that episode would have been yeah, to trivialize not, the episode yeah it's not what that one's really about is it yeah yeah what about you simon yeah i i totally agree i think i think rather than i mean that i do have favorite quotes um and i i knew pretty much as soon as i was told what this book was as in you know as, as soon as we knew what the format was going to be I was going to get for all, yeah. as Peter said, it was supposed to be things said by the doctor. And in some cases, some things said to the doctor. I knew a quote was going to go in this book in a scene that the doctor's not in. When Sarah Jane mm. Smith says to Queen Thalera of Peladon, there's nothing only about being a girl, your majesty. Never mind why they made you a queen. The fact is you are the queen. So just you jolly well let them know it. Mm which is one of my favourite things ever. Um, so I knew that was going to go yeah. in. Mm. But actually, as Peter said, the working out of quotes and uh, what you could say about it, that there are the ones that I was much more, you know, where I feel like I've done a better job yeah. at f drawing something out or finding a new perspective or finding something useful in. Um, <coughs> but, um, but again... I'm not sure favourite is the right word, really. Um, there were ones where I got to the end, you know, I'd finish an entry and go, that's a yeah. good one. Um, uh, and and yeah. like with the Daisy is Daisy, the big thing for me there mm. was realising there was very little to add because the Doctor, the context is all there. It's quite complete, isn't it? And the meaning is all there. So really the only thing that we, as I remember, was to trim the actual quote so that it fitted within the format of the book so you know that those are the kind of deci yeah. decisions and yeah to, to, to hold it down because it's a it's a conversation between the doctor and joe isn't it yeah mm. um one of the things we had to think about as we're choosing quotations was you want them to be the words that are said yeah. um the one or two i looked at and the it was difficult to to uh, to convey them without putting lots of stage directions in mm. Mm. and that rather draws away from the fact that the characters are saying something rather than the characters are doing something. Um, so in that particular example, the way in which we did it was essentially the quotation was, uh, I think it, this is the, it was the daisiest daisy I'd ever seen, I think is what, is what we ended up with as the quotation. 
but then we describe in that entry um, the, the what the doctor says mm. without Joe's um, interventions and comments yeah, yeah. Um, in a in a structured way. Um, so so much of that entry is is what's in the dialogue, which is unusual because most of the other ones are uh, the quotation, <laughs> some observations about the context, and mm. then the, the thing yeah. like the learning point. Mm. And, and that was actually one of those rare ones, wasn't it, Simon? That we actually worked on quite a lot, lot together. Yes. Yeah, yeah, oh, right. and I, you know, and that was, um, as I say, it's so so the the sorts of things I found most satisfying were those kinds mm. of uh, that that kind of collaboration, but also that kind of, yeah, um, you, know, you, you had to think it through really, um, and and because it was more, what's the word? Uh, it was more kind of a, of a, a strenuous activity. Uh, to get that right, um, yeah. that that feels more rewarding. Something you had to think about, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. That's interesting. Did, is, is it kind of um, changed the way you look at Doctor Who? Having done this, I mean, I know you guys are you know you both written a lot about Doctor Who, so probably not. If it hasn't, that's fine. But thinking about Doctor Who in in, in those terms to get this book written, did it? kind of make you look at things slightly differently i went into every episode and um, thinking that i loved some more than others and i came out yeah. of everyone thinking that something something mm -hmm. to enjoy about every single one of them yeah, so much so that you, know, you think, end up yeah. doing a bit of research about a particular quotation mm -hmm. trying to make sure that the wording was right and then <laughs> watching far more of it than you were intending to in the first place <laughs> getting, getting sucked into the story yeah. to watch the rest of it yeah 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 uh was that the same for you simon definitely Definitely. Um, I also mm. think I something you said earlier about, you know, the doctor being optimistic and things. I think a mm. lot of the in, in several cases, the quotes I had in mind to begin with when I went and checked them out mm. yeah, and then had to explain them in context and then had to find something to say about them. They weren't quite as good as i'd initially thought because actually oh, yeah. a lot of them are quite context specific mm. or mm. what you find is that you know the, the the rallying cry that you know the rallying talk you give before you run into battle is basically go and yeah. fight those people and fight them more than they fight us there's not a lot to be learned or gleaned from that um, and similarly, mm. some of the kind of rousing stuff in Doctor Who, once you put that on paper and kind of look at what you can learn from it, it's kind of like, well, it's a bit self-explanatory so or, or, or yeah. straightforward. So so some of the, um, yeah, some of the kind of speeches that I had in mind, I actually found were a bit too straightforward mm. and I needed to find something a bit more nuanced or a bit more interesting. <laughs> Um, so that, yeah, that, that, and that then affects how you watch an episode because you know, you know, a speech is coming up or the doctor's going to rally everybody around yeah, or whatever. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so it changes, it changes those kind of things that, 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 uh, I hadn't expected. Yeah, I, th I think that's quite an interesting point actually, because obviously the, the, the doctor is a, is a character that within a fiction, you know, a kind of adventure series, um, you know, th there's a lot of plot goes into this as well right and in, into into doctor who stories and the doctor and the characters are quite often racing through the plot and reminding us what's going on and acting it out and all the rest of it and it's interesting that with you talking about the daisy's daisy sequence earlier which is from the time monster right which is um i mean that, the plot of that is all over the place but nonetheless for that moment it all kind of stops, doesn't it? They are literally in that in that prison, and it might have just been written to maybe fill out a couple of minutes, but nonetheless, it is it is one of the defining moments of that particular story, and I think it's that's that's the, sometimes the magic of it, isn't it? Now. Is that the things right. that the things that fill in the gaps can be mm. can be very powerful. There's that there's that um, yeah. you know the doctors the doctor's um, speech about the the world revolving mm. in yeah, rows, for example, oh, yeah. is you know is to is to make up time mm. to to fill the number of minutes it, available in the episode. It was, wasn't it? But yeah, it's not just let's speech. have them run, run, run up and down a street. It's let's have a moment where the Doctor talks to Rose about something that's important, yeah. illuminates yeah. his character, and tells her something about him. 
Yeah. Um, yeah, and and similarly, things that are quite innocuous, I found quite mm. useful. I um. I got I got onto one of the entries is from the tenth planet, um, and it's the first Doctor's final mm. words on screen, um, and it's the fact that they're, you know, now you'd make the Doctor's last yeah. words on screen a big thing, um, and the first Doctor says keep <laughs> keep warm, sensibly, yeah. um, mm. <laughs> which kind of doesn't have the gravitas and doesn't have the whatever. So, actually digging into that a bit. Um, was was quite yeah. fun to do and kind of uh and actually they're not the first doctor's last words on screen they're not even william hartnell's last words as the doctor uh because he has last words in the three doctors which are much more fitting um oh, and once so i once true. i'd made that <laughs> connection there yeah. was something really fun about that entry that's that i think is probably mm. one of the ones i really enjoyed getting my head round. It took a bit yeah. it took a bit of you know, that was one where I needed a walk and some washing up and an extra cup of tea and a chop of digestive <laughs> before my then, subconscious put ding. that all together. Yeah. 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 <laughs> one, um, one thing we tended to shy away from was talking about the the metafiction of the series. Yeah. Um there's a there's a temptation as Doctor Who fans to to link things together quite nice. a lot and uh, <laughs> it, it, it's useful to stay within the learning mm. you know the learning point for for the particular episode mm. you, you couldn't always shy away from that <clears throat> sometimes so we got away with that by having for example some quotations which were in multiple different episodes like run that's one of the ones yeah. that simon wrote it, I, it, I, really I didn't enjoyed, i didn't write it that, well, that was steve uh, tribe that was uh, that was Steve Tribe in his original, oh, really? <laughs> his his original go at this, and um, oh, I wish I'd thought of that. It's Pizza such a, it's such a good one, um, and I yes, uh, so I I kind of um, uh, yes, so, uh, so I, we inherited that, but also from mm. that we inherited the fact that we had a format, but we could break the format on occasion, um, which yeah, gives it yeah. gave us a bit of freedom. Mm. Um, yes. Yeah, yes, so I was, I was able to do one with spoilers, edges. for example, as a, as, a, as an example of one that mm. had uh, had multiple different uh, stories that he was in. Yeah. Um, I'd like to uh, just move off from, from the book for a minute. We'll come back to some Doctor Who stuff shortly, but um, I'd like to find out a bit more about you, you two. Um, so how did you both discover your love of writing? I loved writing the, the stuff that was in my uh, primary school, uh, what you did at the weekend stuff, because uh, it, it, was, it, was you know, it was a chance to practice writing. And I realized you could tell a story. And some of it was about you know, the story of what I did at the weekend. You know, I went off to visit Ringway Airport and here's the adventure of how I went through the wrong door and got lost <laughs> and had to be rescued. But also I realized quite early on that one of the things I could do is uh, write I switched on my television on Saturday and I watched mm. episode two of Doctor Who and the Silurians. Yeah. Now then, yeah. retell, retell the story, you see. And, you know, I think I got away with yeah. that for about two or three episodes before my teacher asked me to write something else. <laughs> but it was the idea of telling a story to someone else and getting a reaction yeah. that, I, yeah. that I really enjoyed. And I continued doing that through mm. uh, primary school, secondary school, university, fanzines, yeah. and then having the chance to do it professionally through... Uh, BBC Books and mm. Big Finish. Yeah, well, you wanted to ask next about how you got your kind of, you know, first professional break. So, so save that story for a moment, Peter, and and, and tell us your origin, Simon. Well, I, you know, I've got young children of my own, and they write stories all the time, and their friends write stories all the time. They they come home mm. with school bags full of bits of paper of things they've written about or, or yeah. they write little cards to each other and stuff so i think that's just what you do as a kid you know s stories and drawings and things mm. um i think there was a so i i then was writing i must have been about eight or nine and i was writing stories that involved my little brother um so he would you know they were basically i was writing down the games we played as kids so so yeah, there was a bit of Doctor Who stories. There was a bit of James Bond. There was a bit of Star Wars. The things that we were into, a bit of A Team, and all quite yeah. generic and silly and stuff. But yeah. then um, some of the I can remember some of those stories getting a reaction. That I wrote a cliffhanger that made my brother laugh, and thought, you know, oh, I've got to <laughs> do that. Um, 
and uh did, did you mean to make him laugh yeah well it's just you know i had a i had a, so what i did the sort of thing i still do now where i wrote a cliffhanger without having yeah. any idea how i was going to get out of it and then <laughs> um and then my solution but isn't that how all the best ones come yeah out? yeah yeah I, I've, I've, you know I've, I've actually worked on a thing where the kind of uh impetus was that different yeah. writers all had to do a sort of get out of that ending and then the next person had to take it on yeah yeah. but in yeah. in, yeah, in yeah. this Challenge case the next one in this case the hero was faced mm. with a somebody with a gun and the gun goes off you know and that's the cliffhanger mm-hmm. and then how do i get out of that so the smoke clears and the the person with the gun is has, is dead because he's forgotten that to prevent robbers his gun shoots backwards which was ridiculous <laughs> But it was the only thing I could think of. Yeah, let me make a note of that. Yeah. Um, write that down. And, uh, <laughs> Please, going to use that one. Wait, stop stealing the idea. But, but it, it made my, I don't know how old he was, five-year-old brother yeah. laugh. So it was just it was just that those little funny. things of getting a reaction. Um, and mm. then... That's, well, like you said, Peter, yeah. You know, and as you get older, you sort of, you know, so I'd, I'd, yeah. I had kind of fancied being a writer as a job, but... No more so than I fancied mm. being a pop star or being James Bond or, you know, yeah, I didn't yeah. really know where you, how you did it. Um, and then because yeah. I was reading Doctor Who books, um, I read an interview with Paul Cornell about writing Doctor uh, Who yeah. stuff. And he laid out what you had to mm. do. Um, it was an amazing interview rather than, you know, where do you get your ideas from? It was these are the people you write to. Mm. This is the address. This is what they'll send you, and this is what you have to do, and this <laughs> is how much you get paid. Yeah. And it was like suddenly it was yeah. uh, <laughs> even better. Suddenly it was a job, you know. It's like oh, you could actually do yeah, this. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, well, because it is, it is one of those things. Sorry to interrupt, but like when you're at school and and you you think, yeah, how, you know, how do people write? How, how do you get to do that as a job? And it, it sort of doesn't seem real in a way, does mm. it? And you know. Like when I was making films and stuff, you know, how how do you turn that into a job? And it 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 can seem quite, you know, unreal. I'm I'm really still way, I'm it? still figuring and, uh, that out. Like, how do you how do you do it? Yeah. <laughs> how do you get yeah. anyone to pay you for it? I don't really know. Um, <laughs> yeah. He says that with all <laughs> entitled. That, that's after well. you've actually delivered yeah. the manuscript. Right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 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 of course, take the Douglas Adams approach and just uh, wave at their deadlines as they go by and that, <laughs> just have another glass of wine. That's much easier to do when your first book has been an international <laughs> bestseller and made you a millionaire. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you get the leeway then, yeah. <laughs> it's a good point. Um, so I, when you oh, read that... Oh, go sorry, in. go ahead, Paul. Oh, I was going to say, when you read that bit with um, Paul this. there, Simon, did you... What did you do next that led to you getting professionally published? Did you did you write a spec script or? Yes. So yeah. in those days, um, it was when Doctor Who wasn't on telly, um, and doc, new Doctor Who books were being published by Virgin Publishing, and mm. yeah, I wrote off with the guidelines, and they sent me the guidelines, and I came up with an idea, um, and they sent me a um, a very nice three page rejection letter. Um, <laughs> because they they wanted me to I've spoken to the guy who who sent me that rejection letter and went why on earth yeah. did you spend that amount of time right. you know on my terrible idea and he said because we wanted yeah, to yeah. we wanted to it's make sure you courage. carried on buying the books which I yeah. did um <laughs> but <laughs> but that but that meant I because it was encouraging I sent them something else and I carried on sending them mm. things and the the notes I would get back became more specific about you know so so I had the sense that I was getting better at it and closer to the goal. Mm. And at the same time, you know, I was going to university and learning about stuff and I got a job in yeah. publishing and uh, I sent stuff to anybody I could think of and got bits and pieces back um, and slowly kind of made progress towards that that mm. goal. Actually, it was easy because I knew it took time, but I knew what I wanted to do. Mm. so it was just about how do i get there you know what what how do i get yeah, closer yeah. to that end point um i think it's much harder if you if you kind of think well i fancy working in films or i fancy working in video or whatever but mm. i i don't really know what bit of it i want to do 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think it's a good point. Yeah, yeah. try and be uh, focused on, on on one area. I guess yeah. I, I suppose so. so Pete, Pete no, was... I, I. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> My turn now. You sit back for a minute, Jeff. Behave yourself. He does this all the time, you know. Right. Anyway, uh, but if I recall, I mean, Peter, was your was your route up through the fanzines because you were writing quite a lot of uh, quite a sort lot of articles, weren't you? Sort of. I, when I was a teenager, I sent ideas into mm. the BBC. Because I thought that's how, I thought that's what you did. Best way to do um, it. And, straight uh, to the lion's mouth. And, and un, unlike production companies these days, the BBC wanted to um, make sure that they, they engage with uh, with you know, licensed players. Uh, mm. So I got letters back from people like Anthony Reid and uh, Douglas Adams and Chris Boucher uh, about things I'd sent in. <laughs> and in Simon's crazy. Uh, with, you never told me that. <laughs> I, I had no idea. And, and, and in, in particular, uh, I got, yeah. the letter I got from Douglas Adams you know, had, had an interesting note about what I'd written. It wasn't just, you know, yeah. thank you for your submission, which was very neatly wow. typed. It was... He, in fact, the phrase that sticks out was, you know, in this particular story, I think that, and I think that might have been the master was in the story. Mm. He said, I, I think that, you know, the master's plan is burning down a house to boil an egg. You know, what a great, what a great phrase that is about, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the motivations of the particular character. With Chris Boucher, because I'd sent him some thoughts about Blake Seven, um, mm. I got, I think it was something like a two or three page written, handwritten letter. Oh, wow. And it was written over two days. Either he'd written it over two days or he'd faked it as though it was written over two days. Because halfway through the letter, there was a a change of pen. And, you know, it was sorry for the delay. It was a bit busy recently. Mm. And then he was carried on talking about what I'd written. Um, So that suggested, you know, that it it was interesting to I got some useful constructive feedback. It wasn't a yes. Uh, And then when it came to, uh, and then, you know, I didn't get a job as a, as a, a writer. But I got a job working as a technical author for IBM, mm. working with, among others, Justin Richards and oh. uh, Craig Hint, who had oh, written right. for yeah. one of those early Virgin novels. Mm. As it happened, Justin and Andy Lane, both university contemporaries, <clears throat> had uh, had taken on the editing role for one of the Decalogue series, which yeah. is a series of 10 short stories, and asked me whether I had any ideas. And I, th- I thought, yes, I do. And I wrote a story about uh, Sarah Jane and K9. Mm. And that was my first professionally published piece of fiction. It's fantastic. And, that's and as a result of that, that was if you like, my calling card for when the BBC books came along and said, we're looking for yeah. people who've, who've got interesting things to do. Mm. I have to say, back in those days, companies like uh, Virgin Publishing and BBC Books were much more prepared to spend mm. time and effort. And it's a not insubstantial thing to do. Um, encouraging new writers. completely mm. new writers to mm. submit ideas. I think the yeah, closest there is to this moment is the Big Finish short trip opportunity yeah. competition in, in memory of Paul Sprague. Um, uh, and as it happens, I'm very happy to say, you know, I'm as the producer of that range now for Big Finish, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm one of the judges for that, that competition each year. Yeah. And that's a kind of you know, reflection on give back about opportunities for people who don't have the the, the set of contacts mm. or the the network mm. already in place, but have got interest, enthusiasm, talent, and can write to a specification. Mm. That's a very long yeah, but, answer to a simple question, isn't it? I'm sorry. I, no, no. <laughs> no. Well, I I think sorry, someone go ahead. I was just going to say my first professional commission was a short story as well for Big mm. Finish's first short trips book. So clearly, all the best writers start in the short stories. Good route then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> clearly, I, I have tried to convince them that they should, should commission it on you know. Um, yeah. Uh, on alphabetical order, but I realise that that just means that Ben Aronovich will write everything. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I have to say because I remember and I, I, I put it out there actually. There uh, was it up a bit that one. Um, Frontier Worlds was, I think, the first novel of yours that I that I read, Peter. Um, which is uh, and for, for those who don't know, it's an Eighth Doctor adventure by BBC Books, nineteen ninety eight nine or something like that. Anyway, yep, nineteen ninety nine. I think, and, it, and it's. There, we go, there you go. And I, I honestly, I remember, I, I think I wrote a letter to somebody because I got a letter back um, just, just remarking on how much I'd really enjoyed this book because there oh, was... Oh, bless um, you for that. Thank the, you. 
uh, <laughs> I can't remember who, who sent me the letter or, or who, sent, who I sent it to, but somebody wrote back and saying thank you very much and you know really appreciate it. But but it, it, it was like the the authenticity of the world building I think there that that I really enjoyed. You know, it's it's if I recall, I mean, it's, it's a while since I read it, but it focuses very heavily on one of the Doctor's companions fits. He's our kind of way into it, and and we got compassion, the the human TARDIS in there as well, which is always a great idea. I I love that. But I yeah, Frontier Worlds, I would recommend to everybody, and uh, and I I remember Casal as well, the the you know the the, the earlier story, um, which which again great, but Frontier Worlds particularly is the only one out of all the eight Doctor ranges that I've actually had occasion to write a letter and say how much I enjoyed this this novel because I, I genuinely genuinely did so it's quite nice to be able to tell you that directly Peter well thank, thank you I, I really appreciate that um uh, yeah it's, it's always lovely to hear, hear what people think uh, there was a time when um recognizing that a lot of the help I'd got with my mm. early stuff was reading what other writers had put onto their website so Simon talks about hearing Paul Cornell talk about you know his his writing experience I remember reading, among others, uh, Gary Russell had put a whole load of stuff on a website okay, that he used yeah. to run mm. about the things that he'd written, the experience he'd got, um, uh, and so on. And I thought, you know, I can do this as well. And I'd written various short stories and audios and uh, novels for mostly for BBC books. So I published um, little narratives about my mm. experience of being commissioned. Uh, I published the, uh, the, the, this is back in the days when the, the author retained the copyrights, by the way. So I published the outlines as well, and the scene breakdowns, and a sample chapter. And I yeah. also used to publish all the reviews I could find of it, good, bad, and indifferent. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because you know, I thought you know, here's here's an interesting way of of viewing what the if you like the end result of of what yeah. people have said. Um, and uh, yeah, so that was that was kind of part of my my reflection on mm. sharing back with people. Uh, how I'd got into writing and how I wanted to encourage them to do it as well. Yeah, that's really good. What 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 would be the um, main sort of advice you'd give someone now, you, you know, who's trying to get into writing, bearing in mind how different it is these days, and and also in some ways harder, I, I would say maybe. Do you think? Like you, like you both, I, you know. I, I think I think it's definitely harder. Yes. Yeah. So. Um, Yes, there, there are fewer Doctor Who books being published mm. these days than there were, you know, there were, there were um, uh, what it was, it was like 22 a year, wasn't it? Yeah. It was yeah. two a month except for Christmas. Um, <laughs> so, so uh, the, and, and companies are less willing to go through a slush mm. pile of stuff as well. So BBC books will typically commission from people who've got a track record already of having yeah. written, not yeah. always necessarily having written Doctor Who. Mm. Um uh, there's, a, there's a piece of advice from Eric Seward uh, in Doctor Who magazine when he was asked about what's your advice uh, about pe to people who want to write Doctor Who. Mm. His, his answer was, don't. Don't do it. And then he went on to explain <laughs> why. And he was, what he was saying was, don't just want to write Doctor Who. Mm. Want to write. You want to enjoy yes. just writing. In, just in general. For two reasons. Yeah. One is, yeah. the chances of writing for Doctor Who are more difficult not impossible but more difficult mm. and the second thing is that that's all you really want to write you you know you're you're not really exploring your interests and your enthusiasms yeah. more widely yeah I what, what are your thoughts Sam? i i agree with all of that i think um a, uh, uh, peter's already mentioned the paul spragger um competition that big finish runs every year which i definitely yeah. recommend but actually just writing just just Right. If you want to Just write, it. it's yeah. it's you know if you want to work on a film, you've got to find people who'll do that. You need kit, you need crew, you need support. Writing, you can do yourself. Yeah. You can fill out a notebook, mm -hmm. just a bit. Just finish a story, then go back and make it better. Um, yeah. There's various um, the, places that will buy short stories. You know, the money's not amazing, but it's something. Yeah, yeah it's still out there. It's mm. a start, um, yeah. and and what you what uh, you do I is you right there you with... build up a track record, mm. and once you've got a few things published, then mm. yeah. then BBC Books and Big Finish and whoever else will consider you, and and there are loads of people who've right. got in that yeah. way. Yeah. So it's not it's not um, mm. the route has changed, but it's not you know, the route. Mm. It, there is still a route uh, if that's what you want to do. Yeah. Um, and also, uh, and, I got yeah, a, and the other no, thing is that. 
and it's, it's, it's easier now to publish things than ever before for yourself. Yes. Yeah. If you yeah. if you're saying you know I want it to be published by BBC Books, the opportunities are quite small. Mm. The if you want to write for Big Finish, it's not it's not there's more opportunity, but it's still mm. quite small. It's like saying you know I want to write for Harper Collins, or I want to write one of the yeah. Star Wars. Yeah. Books, yeah. or I want to write a Star Trek tie-in it's book. Too niche, but you yeah. can put, you can write your own stuff, which you're enthusiastic about, and share it still through fanzines and yeah, web pages yeah. and blogs and so on. If you're really enthusiastic about writing, you will want to write and publish it yeah. anywhere. If you're simply focused on getting it published by a particular publisher, mm. you're narrowing down yeah. your yeah, your broader, options yeah. right yeah, from the start. I it's, it's interesting what you said there, Simon, like about with films and, and filmmaking and stuff, because, yeah, you you know, I see quite a lot of people online who are aspiring filmmakers. And I sort of think, go out and do it. You know, when I was <laughs> starting about, out, yeah. you know, 25 years ago, mm -hmm. it was quite a bit harder than it is now. You know, I didn't have a f camera in my pocket that could make a half decent film. <laughs> but you're right. You know, you've got to get your, your sound and your, your crew and stuff like that. But to be a writer, you, you don't need any of that, you know. So, so just go and do it. And I think that what you said about, you know, self-publishing and things is, is quite interesting as well because I used to shoot quite a lot of music videos uh, for, you know, indie bands and stuff. <clears throat> and over time, things changed and, and record labels and stuff would be more interested to know that a band already had something of a following online, mm. i.e. an in already invested audience. So if they were going to get a you know, one-off single deal or EP, you know, whatever, or, uh, you know, if, is there people who's going to buy it already? And I think if you can self-publish and, you know, make that start to work for you, you probably become a bit more of a, an appealing prospect when you start going, you know, to the, to the publishers and stuff. I, th I think it's also about making connections with people as well. So, mm. I mean, I, yeah. you know, very consciously moved myself into fan circles because i knew people like peter yeah would be who had published books and whatever could give me advice mm -hmm. and things um but i also was looking for anything r even vaguely related to publishing that i could get in on and i was working for an advertising yeah. agency and a publishing company you know and things <laughs> like that trying to you know doing yeah. management yeah. jobs weirdly the management job I was doing and having a spreadsheet for the budget led mm. to me getting my name on the cover of a book for the first time. Because when I was put up for a oh, job right. oh, oh, yeah. editing a book by Paul Cornell was uh, editing a book mm. for Big Finish and couldn't uh, couldn't meet the commitments because he was on Doctor Who writing Father's Day and um, kind of something something yeah. needed to give. He suggested that I edit the book. And Gary Russell, who was then at Big Finish, uh, his concern mm. was could I run, could basically could I project manage an anthology and get it in on time? Yeah. And I could go, well, this is the spreadsheet I use for running other publishing projects. And he was like, well, yeah. you know what you're doing. Yeah. So this job I've been trying to escape was the thing that led mm. to my my name being on the cover of a book for the first time so all of that uh, all of that stuff is yeah. useful all of that is you pick it all up and apply it mm. i guess the thing is really I suppose is, the message is, is that like there isn't a single earlier, answer about here's the route through mm. you have to go to get to where you want to be it's a whole yeah. concatenation yeah. of different experiences and enthusiasms and motivations and contacts yeah. and each person will have yeah. their own different route through um, I, I like having a drive uh, and McCormack talking about how she got through. You know, I've worked with Una on uh, uh, yeah. Blake Seven most recently. Okay. Um, you know, she got into um, she's a, a, a New York Times best-selling author now. Mm. You know, but she got into writing because she wrote Tolkien fan fiction. She just loved yeah, writing. Yeah. She just loved sharing it with people yeah. on bulletin boards and and so on. I mean, it's yeah, a thing well, now, isn't it? You you can build up a following can't you? you can find your audience small to start with but you know reading excerpts, excerpts of your stories on, on on tiktok putting links on to blogs on mm. twitter and sorry x or whatever it is you know all that i mean social media is is, is a great tool for yeah. you know for introducing yourself to to wider communities i think yeah um, so I just like to that was quite um, wisdom like of me there, wasn't it? I was like a yes, like, yeah, it was quite, it quite like I knew profound. What I, was I yeah, yeah. It was quite impressive. <clears throat> I didn't hey. 
So I, I can't follow that <laughs> at the same don't, level, don't so I'm try. just going to change, change Go subject then. completely. Change subject. Go left. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, Simon, you've um, got Hootopia coming out in... Uh, oh, well, yes. B- about a month and a half, yes. I guess, isn't it? Or a little bit sooner. So, um, we, we don't know much about it, but it sounds sounds pretty awesome. So, oh, give uh, me a sec. What, what can you tell us Hang about on a sec. That? I'll go and get it. Oh. <gasps> oh, yeah, I bet you've got the copies <laughs> available. One of the, uh, one of the joys of, of writing these things is you get <laughs> author copies quite early on, you see. Um, yeah. yeah. So, uh, <laughs> So does, does that ever get boring, Peter? Is it still as exciting as it was in day no, one? No, no. I, I, I open the box and I, mm. I, I just breathe in the paper like this. <laughs> oh, <it's fantastic. laughs> Go on in, Simon. Shows it. Look what at we this. Got? It's oh, look fabulous. At that. So this oh, is... Uh, speak, speaking of Una McCormack, she worked on that with you and... Uh, and Johnny, Johnny Morris, so, yeah, right? so it's a, it's a big... It's absolutely beautiful. Yeah. It's a coffee table... <clears throat> looks, yeah. Uh, ...guide to wow. oh, all yeah. of Doctor Who. Um... Loads and loads and loads of it. Uh, absolutely beautiful. Um, I'm not really showing it at its. You kind of need to. <laughs> you need to flick through it yourselves. But, but it's. It's. It, it's um, yeah, we, yes. we kind of want yeah, to touch feel it. that. It looks yeah. weighty yeah. Yeah. and it looks glossy and shiny and lovely. Lovely. And yeah. yeah, so this nice was. Um, typesetting and everything. And then beautiful Lee binding. Uh, illustrations and yeah, oh, it's, it's just oh, it's absolutely yeah. so. Designer Rich Atkinson has really uh, knocked himself out on that. Um, mm. So that's um, that's uh, it was Johnny <clears throat> Jonathan Morris's project, and he had me and Una as yeah. assistants. So we just did what he said. Really, um, it's really right. fun, and he gave us uh, <laughs> he gave us little assignments. Didn't want to go <laughs> um, and it's so it's it's you know a kind of. Uh, 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 cornucopia yeah. of uh, Doctor Who all the characters, Doctors, companions monsters, mm. machines um, and really fun hopefully a slightly different take on all of these things uh, which is what we're off- off- obviously trying yeah. to do so uh, the, lots of the entries are written uh, from yeah. as if written by the people themselves um, so mm, yeah, I had uh, thought, yeah. I had quite a time, I'm trying to remember who I wrote I wrote, um, oh yeah, I'm quite pleased of Sarah Jane Smith. I think I think that one was quite, go on. Ooh, that okay. was quite a good yeah. one. Um, and uh, yeah, just just a just great fun really. Um, and it overlapped with what I was it's doing on joy for that. Daily Doctor, so mm. it was slightly nuts a few weeks. Yeah, um, but, um, <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like oh, I'm watching more Doctor Who. Great, so. Can't really complain. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's not a bad job, is it? Really, it's fantastic. Yeah, I'm yeah. very much looking forward to, to looking at that one. Beautiful, yeah. doesn't it? Looks really, really nice. You should ask Simon about his David Whittaker book as well, which is um, um, thoroughly researched, um, Ooh. meticulous in its Ooh. detail, Come on, and and really, really nicely written. I mean, it's not just a, it's not yeah. just been dashed off. It's a, it's a work of a work of research and love. Oh, bless you. Wow. Is this? Um, uh, and David Whittaker in an exciting adventure with television. That is exactly it, which is published on the sixth of November awesome. by Ten Acre. <laughs> yes. So, uh, yep. for those who don't know, shame on you. Uh, but uh, David Whittaker was the first story <laughs> editor of Doctor <laughs> Who. Uh, the mm. so he uh, he also wrote more episodes. He's credited on as writer on more episodes in the nineteen sixties than anybody else. Um, yeah. As a result of that, he's also the writer of more missing episodes than any other single writer um but he's the guy who commissioned yes. the dalek stories mm. he ke- yeah. probably came up with the word exterminate for the daleks um he uh created oh, right. or wrote the first episodes <clears throat> of the second doctor companions vicky mm. victoria and zoe so there's loads the whiskey, of yeah, yeah. There's loads of kind of important foundational stuff he was involved in. Um, And until a few years ago, we knew very, very little about him. He died in 1980, um, Mm. really just as fandom was getting, was beginning to interview people and and chart the history of the programme in depth. Mm. Um, And it turns out, which is what I found out uh, in 2016 when I was Mm. researching The Evil of the Daleks for a book, um, that there's a whole load of stuff that we thought we knew about him and gets repeated a lot um, that isn't true. 
So one thing that you'll see quite a lot right. said about him yeah. is that he had a he wrote a play, he was an actor and he wrote a play for the Theatre Royal York that was spotted by somebody at the BBC who then offered him a job working in television. <laughs> That's not true at all. He was he had already written for television when he wrote his first when he staged his first mm. play. Um yeah. So, uh, so, and that changes what we know about him and what he's what drove him and things. So, I, yeah, I've just been on a great long six year research thing, and um, it's a bit wow. weird to be able to share it with everybody because I've kind of been sitting on all of this <laughs> for quite a long time. Um, but yeah, it's mm. it's um, I just I saw it, it, um, yeah, it, it came up on um. The Doctor Who site merchandise guide, which is uh, a, I have it bookmarked, nice because uh, they'll update with all new books and and merch and stuff like that, and it's a great little website f- for you know finding out everything that's coming out. So yeah, they just put it up there the other day. So I guess pre-orders are, are open now. For yeah, it, yeah. Or, so uh, pre- pre-orders, pre-orders opened last week. Um, so it's it's <coughs> all it's all suddenly it's out there and there's a cover out there and you know people are talking about going. it. So but I spoke yeah, to um, yeah, so, I spoke to David's niece last week and sent her a copy of the cover and she's very oh, excited wow. about yeah. it. So um, all of that kind of stuff is is really uh, really nice. Yeah. I'm, I'm yeah, looking forward it's, to that because it's it, it's like you said, you know, a lot of um, a, a lot of people who are working on the show in the sixties, there there are there are some names that we seem to know a lot about or or enough mm-hmm. about. You know, we know a decent amount about Ferris Lambert and where she was and what she was doing, and probably there's a whole load more stuff that we could probably find out. But you're right, David Whittaker, who was instrumental in shaping those early years of of Doctor Who and writing as well as that, writing some of the most incredible moments in you know in 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 his episode i mean crikey the some of the darker ones as well i mean the rescue when you look at it you know is is incredibly dark you know you you got a young teenage girl who's been manipulated by pretty much a serial killer you know what i mean it's that kind of stuff for years you know he changes the way she thinks he imprisons her and you know there's a bit of stockholm syndrome going on and then power of the daleks where we have you know the daleks at their most evil you know they, they are dark in in episodes four five and six of that story and in the way the humans sort of play on that you know it's david Whitaker had Whitaker had a very clever way of bringing real darkness into stories but at such a level where we almost don't see it until a point where you stop and think oh is this really what i'm thinking it is and it, and it carries you with it anyway. You cannot take your eyes off of david with at least i can't you know you start watching them you're hooked you know, you're there. The Crusades again. It's just incredible. So I'd, I'd definitely be looking, looking to find out more about him. Yeah, I, I think. Well, he's that's a, that's a, a, an interesting me, example of, of <laughs> inspiration for for writing as well. One of the mm. the earliest Doctor Who books I read was was the the Crusade, uh, and yeah. indeed, you know the the original Daleks book as well. Uh, just you know how to convey that mm. interestingly in prose, as as opposed to being on the telly. Uh, mm. You've also done a, a black archive uh, thing, haven't you, Simon? About the edge of destruction. I have. Oh, this is. I, 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 I'm glad we brought you, Peter. Um, this is good. <laughs> yes. Um, so uh, uh, I've also written. Part, so part of the the thing was that in in researching all of this David Whittaker yeah. stuff, I realised there were things that weren't going to fit uh, in the book. So I've also mm. written a black archive book on the edge of destruction the third Doctor Who serial, which oh, is a, mm, a very like odd mm. little two-part yeah. story. Um, and importantly, the the, the reason yeah. this came about is because uh, two things. One was that Toby Haydoke, uh who does a podcast called mm. Too Much Information, where he goes through each episode of Doctor Who in great depth, uh, the production history. <laughs> and um, there are production files. There's a lot of paperwork about the early years of Doctor Who. But there isn't a production mm. file for The Edge of Destruction. Um, so Toby was kind of asked, was there anything in my David Whittaker research that could add light to it or anything I'd found? Mm. So I sent him some things, but basically said to him, there's just this gap <coughs> in the in the paper trail. If you put it yeah. all in order, in chronological order, there's just this hole. Um, and then last year, I uh, Una McCormack actually uh, wangled me an invitation to the Large Hadron Collider and CERN, which was extraordinarily exciting. Ooh. 
Um, but one yeah. of the things we were talking about there was that what the Hadron Collider is doing and what people are doing in trying to detect mm. black holes is you're looking for something that you can't look at directly. So the way that you do yeah. that is yeah. you kind of work <laughs> out the fuzzy edges. <laughs> mm. And once you've worked out the fuzzy edges of what, what's there, you can then make deductions about what's on the inside. So I've done that to the edge of destruction. <laughs> Starting at its fuzzy edges. Yeah. So so way, so what do we through the middle? What do we know? That's the first part of the book. Yeah. So what what do we know for sure? What are the facts? And then from that, ten mm. deductions, ten absurd theories, including things okay. like, yeah. why does the TARDIS have randalls? Is one of them. I think I know. Um, oh, oh, really? <laughs> but. To find oh, out what I like about that is it's, it's honest about speculation. I knew you were going to yeah. say that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, don't tell I, us. I, I like the fact that it's honest about speculation rather than presenting speculation as fact. Yes, yes. which is yes. has been yeah. sort of Good characteristic point. of a lot yeah. of Doctor Who's history in the past, and it's become, mm, yeah. as, as indeed Simon unpicks in his <laughs> David Whittaker book, uh, it becomes a fact because it's been stated. By apparently authoritative sources. Yeah, there's a. There's yeah, a, there's a I, I'm looking forward to your book on Alice Frick next. By the way. On what side? Alice Frick. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I I feel that uh, Paul Hayes has already done that in uh, his uh, amazing um, pull to open, which is a is a history of uh, the first year of Doctor Who, or the, or, or rather oh, the yes. year that it gets made. That, that's yeah. that's yeah. amazing. Yeah. So so you know the the annoying thing about that book, it's really good. But he sent it to me, and I was <laughs> deep into writing my David Whittaker book. Yeah. And I've been reading all the paper. I've been reading the same paperwork he has. I've been, you know, reading about all the stuff. Yeah. And then I read his chapter, and it's like, oh, I've re I've read about Eric Maskvitz, the former head of light entertainment at the BBC, <laughs> the man who wrote um, a Nightingale sang at in Berkeley mm. Square. Um, He's the guy who yeah, commissions yeah. the science fiction report uh, that, that is the earliest dated document in the, the Doctor Who production files, and so it was clearly an influence on it. Um, Paul describes Eric Maswitz in a way like, I feel like I've met him. You know, I've, I feel like I'm in the room with him. Um, amazing, amazing yeah, bit of writing. Wow. It's really it vivid. Writing. And all mm. of these people who are on the peripheries of, of what we know about Doctor Who, he, he really ties all that all together. It's yeah. an amazing, amazing piece of work. Damn him. Um, yeah, I, I did kind of have to think. I'm, I'm going to have to. I'm going to have to change what I'm doing. That, that's, that's, very, game a bit. that's very typical of authors, isn't it, Simon? We, we like to say, yeah, "I really enjoyed it." <laughs> really enjoyed it. Yeah. It was through, fantastic. Through gritted teeth, yeah. And the thing is, when it actually is really fantastic as well, it's like because uh, nothing you pull apart from it. Then it's, yeah, it's like you're yeah, yeah. Oh. Well done, brilliant. <clears throat> <laughs> So, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, what can I ask, what are you both working on at the moment? This, this is a question that often gets people saying, we can't tell you. Can't tell so, you, uh, can't tell you. Yeah. <laughs> Cause I don't well, yet. alas, I can't tell you because nothing has been announced. Um, <laughs> oh. <laughs> but it, but, it, but at, at, at the moment, it's all for Big Finish. Oh, okay. wow. Uh, so really in fact, the only thing I can there. mention is that, and I can't even tell you what the title of it is, uh, but I'm currently working on the winner of this year's uh, Paul Sprague uh, Big Finish uh, short trip opportunity oh, yeah, because yeah. that needs Fantastic. to get to the studio and be recorded in time for uh, December. And the way Big Finish yeah. works is we tend not to announce uh, what things are until they've been recorded because that's the point yeah, at which yeah. you've actually got something to talk about. You know, you, you yeah, know it's yeah. not going to sort of <laughs> accidentally slip and not happen. Um, yeah. But there's some other bits and pieces I'm working on which uh, are for next mm. year. Alas, I, I can't say what they are, but they're fantastic. Okay, That's what I like. Exciting. See, I'm excited. <laughs> what about you, you to tell us anything. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, we've just listed loads of stuff I've got out in the next week, month stuff. No. I, that's, yeah. you, know, you need that, a break, if anything, <laughs> yeah. surely. Is that, yeah. is that not enough? <laughs> Have I, not, have I not sweated and bled enough for you? <laughs> no, <is> just... <laughs> we want more. <laughs> I'll tell, tell you what um, a, a whole bunch of fans are going to ask, though. Uh, I would like to know, are you going to write any more Blake 7? Is there going to be any more Blake 7 Big Finish or, or something like that? That that would be lovely, wouldn't it? Mm. Ooh, nice. Yes. Nicely Very diplomatic so. answer, yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I, it, yeah, that's... Mm. <laughs> oh, I'm excited. I'm excited. <laughs> 
you know, if there, if there was like two two series from seventies, <coughs> eighties, which I, I I could just lose myself in, it, it's the, yeah, it's Doctor Who and Blake Seven. I mean, I I always kind of liked things like Space Nineteen Ninety Nine, but I think with those things, I like the idea of it more than the actual show because I can never remember actually sitting through an entire episode of Space Nineteen Ninety Nine. And to be fair, I'm not even sure I could do it now, to be honest. But Blake Seven, Doctor Who, give me that any time, you know. With the that, those were definitely my two my two principal passions. Obviously, I love lots yeah. of other stuff as well. Um, you know, mm. I can remember watching watching the Time Tunnel. I can remember watching Star Trek and its various incarnations. Yeah. But yeah, the things that stuck in my mind were definitely Blake Seven and Doctor Who. And indeed, you know, when you mentioned Frontier Worlds as the novel, Frontier Worlds was the name of the fanzine that I ran with a couple of my pals for a number of years. Uh, and that was a Blake Seven and Doctor Who fanzine, which had fiction and yeah. stories and analysis and yeah. interviews and various bits and pieces. Um, and as a good example, I think of you know the equivalent of mm. doing your own web page <clears throat> these days. You know, uh, we didn't worry that yeah. we were only selling this to I don't, yeah. I can't remember what the biggest print run we ever had. It's like five hundred, I think, yeah. at the at the maximum. You know, it's we didn't worry about then. oh, it's only gone out to yeah. five hundred people. It was mm. we've done something we can share with uh, with people uh, who are like minded. Yeah. Uh, and they seem yes, to really like yeah. it and, and comment and send stuff back. So the same is going to be true of, of, of websites and so on. Mm. Yeah. Well, in a way, it's kind of like what we do with the podcast, isn't it, Jeff? Yeah. You know, we, we yeah. start this just a project yeah. and we're getting crazy numbers of, of listeners now, which is just mad. Mm. You know? <laughs> yeah. And yeah, to, to find a, you know, an audience who, yeah. you know, we're, we're just two nerds talking about Doctor Who. And, you know, <laughs> Pretty much. Uh, occasionally you're, you're, other two, stuff, you're two nerds you know, talking to, to two nerds know. this evening, aren't you? Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, we're two nerds who quite often have fantastic guests who sell it for us. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but if you want to Plus just go invited in, us this fine, evening as well. Yeah. Which yeah. Is great. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, when, when you find a, an audience that shares yeah. your point of view and you know you, you you're saying the things that they think and, 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 like, and like, they start and tuning in and yeah you know, like what great. you do as well mm. yeah i should yeah, say by the way really i love amazing. i love working with simon it was a, it was a, a chance i couldn't turn down when steve cole asked me to take mm. part in this um simon has been a great support through through big finish and stuff um there was something i i, I particularly remember uh you remember may remember this as well simon it was a uh, it was a fifth doctor audio I was writing, and Simon had done one of the the earlier stories. Yeah. It was called the Chaos Pool, and uh, oh, I had a bit of a crisis yeah. of confidence as I was coming up with the outline, um, mm. and, and so I, I thought, who who can I trust to give me some advice on this and, and give me some candid um, advice about what's working and what's not working? So I sent up the outline to Simon, mm. um, and I, I knew that I'd got it about right. When the principal comment he had about one of the cliffhangers was was simply the word yeah. "ha ha!" <laughs> exclamation mark. <laughs> and that was, that was exactly what I was hoping for for that particular cliffhanger. You see, it was <laughs> it was a diabolically so it was that kind of twist. constructive, evidence-based yeah. feedback I was looking for that yeah, I really yeah. enjoyed. Yeah, yeah, that was, uh, that was a good twist. I remember the chaos pool. That's a key to time one, isn't it? <clears throat> mm. Yeah, I was going to ask actually. Do you two guys get on quite well with working yeah, together can, on this project? Yeah. Yeah. Can't, I can't bear him. Like I get dragged into these <laughs> things <laughs> with him all the time. <laughs> I know that feeling, Peter. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, uh, Peter and I. Yes, yeah, so we've been friends for a long time. So it's it's all very. Uh, um, yeah. It, it's just very easy, really. Um, it was, uh, you know, we uh, we didn't really yeah, you, commu- you tell, we didn't yeah. communicate a great deal in writing mm. our bits we just got on and did it kind of trusting each other you know we know each other so mm, so yeah. mm. um there was a bit of back and forth in the editorial stages and we mm. i think uh yeah there's definitely some you know bits and pieces where we kind of looked at each other's stuff and and steve cole who's our editor yeah, uh, yeah. you know reworked bits and pieces and in cons- consultation and stuff but um yeah it was very easy um i uh I think I think that more uh, the only time I've kind of thought it was more strange. I edited, I was script editor on a Blake Seven mm. play that Peter wrote uh, a couple of years ago. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, but he was the producer, so I was working for him, but he was working for me. It was a weird <laughs> kind of who. So there was a kind of thing of some kind of like an infinite. There was a kind of there was a kind of thing of who tells who what to do i'm not quite yeah. sure where the 
<laughs> you know, it was fine, but there was a kind Just of thing passing of passing memos around each other. But you know, there's always yeah. a, there's always a point where you don't quite agree. So so who gets the final say on things in that situation? Yeah. I think that that was. Uh, it all got sorted out. But it was, uh... do, do you know, the, the terrible thing is I didn't think about that at the time. I, one of the things was, you know, because I was, uh, I was working on nine scripts at the same time. It was three box mm. sets of three. Um, and I knew that I was going to be writing the, the, the final one. Um, in fact, the, the executive producer uh, at the time, David Richardson, essentially said, you know, how many do you want to write? And I said, well, if I'm going to be doing this many and something else as well. Um, I think you know, yeah. I, I think I can probably only find time for one, uh, you know, rather than oh, fantastic! I'll do all nine. Um, so I did that, and it always obviously, if you're writing something, you you need to have somebody give you that other perspective. Uh, so uh, that's why we invited Simon into to script edit nine, and and mm -hmm. by the by the time of the third box set, I'd taken over as producer from David Richardson, mm -hmm. and do you know Simon? Yeah. I never I never thought of that sort of that sort of hierarchy. When I was asking you to do it, I just thought, you know, here's someone who will give me some some sensible, sound advice uh, yeah. that I will that I will value from so, you know, yeah. from the stuff we'd done we'd done previously. Um, and, and also because Peter was the producer and producer of the whole range, he knew it or, you know, he knew the stories, he knew the context and whatever. Mm -hmm. His Blake Seven knowledge is much greater than mine as well. So I, you know, I was kind of coasting in his wake. And mostly I think my notes were it had. um. Mm. It was Villa, wasn't it? And it was mostly I'd worked with Michael Keaton, the actor, several times before. So I was just thinking, what would he like to do? Maybe, maybe we should give him some. Yeah. You know, may, why don't we get him to play a different character at the? He let him be undercover at the beginning, so he can play a different part because I know he yeah. likes doing that. And then the gag is that everybody knows mm -hmm. it's Villa. Would that work? I think that was my <laughs> chief contribution. That, that, to the that was that was a <laughs> terrific note. And that's a terrific note, and it it, it really it really uh, launches the story very nicely because <clears throat> the story is about you know <clears throat> mm. Villa trying to find his way back to the Liberator and struggling against it, and um, you know the, the irony, as Simon says, is he thinks he's being tremendously smart, and actually <laughs> everyone knows it's him, <clears throat> which is you know a, a really good a really good route into the story. And so that that worked really nice. And as you say, it, it works really nice for Michael Keating. When you're writing audio, I don't know what Simon's thought about it is. It, mm. <clears throat> there's a sort of hierarchy of people you want to please. The, first of all, <laughs> you want to please yourself because you want to be enjoying writing, yeah. writing the story. You know, you don't want to have a miserable time doing it. You want to please the script editor and or the producer because they're the ones who are going to say, yep, we want to go ahead and do this. You want to please the people who are in the studio because if they're having a fun time and enjoying it, yes. not frivolously, but because they feel like they're being given something interesting to do, mm. they'll, they'll they'll come up with the goods. And then, of course, yeah. last but not least, uh, the audience. You want them to be really enjoying it as well. Um, mm. And so that's, well, that's and a, a balance of, uh, of stuff to write. And I, and I think if the people you know higher up in that list are enjoying <clears> it, then the audience will as well. It, it kind of filters down through, through I think. doesn't it? Yeah. Mm. You right. hope so, yeah, because you know you, you're hoping yeah. that your producer, executive producer, have got a, a feeling for what's going to work for the particular mm. series that you're that you're working on. Yeah. There are one or two things I've worked on where the producers have changed halfway through. Mm. But there's what, one thing I've worked on that they changed halfway through and then changed back again. <laughs> <All right>. <laughs> so <laughs> so you, you're going. What were the notes that, that person that, that then said? And how did that fit into that? <laughs> yeah, but most of all, you want to have a fun time. Like the people you, yeah, I, yeah. you know, I, I'm I'm fortunate in that I can be a bit, you know, I can pick and choose a bit about about what I do, uh, and I, I choose yeah. to do projects which interest me, uh, and mm. people who I will enjoy working with, because um, yeah. because the, the whole thing will be a will be a generally happier experience. Yes. Um, there have been a couple of things I've been asked to write this year when I've said, "Oh, that sounds absolutely fascinating, but I don't think I would enjoy it very much, and I wouldn't do a great job, so I'd be letting you down." Um, yeah. you know, and it's, it's so important, isn't it? You know, to, to <clears throat> yeah. enjoy what you're yeah. doing and, and therefore Absolutely. do better on it. Yeah. But, but as I say, not not yeah. not all writers are in that in that situation. So uh, you know, no. it works for me. It might not work for others. Simon yeah. is in, in constant demand, as you've already heard. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> 
Simon, quite Simon like darling, we've got a new project. We'd love you to take part in yeah. it if you would, please. It's, it's <laughs> never, fail, it never goes uh, like that. Yeah, it's yeah, going to be that, fabulous. That, now, that is what sounds very familiar. Yes. <laughs> that, um, can't pay for it, but... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah the exposure will be great. Oh, no, they yeah, don't even offer... Just think of it, your name and lights yeah, they, everywhere. They don't even offer that as well. It's just, you know... Uh, yeah, it's... No, it's uh, oh, well. Yeah, at, at different points in my sort of career... Um, I just said yes to everything. Yeah. Um, and you yeah. learn a lot doing that. Um, yeah. You know, you learn the things you like doing <laughs> and you learn the people you like working with and mm. contra Um And, uh, and mm. yeah, and you can be a bit more selective as you, as you go on, I guess. Um, I, uh, I think we were talking earlier about, you know, don't just try and be a Doctor Who writer. Mm. I, when I started, I had an idea of all the things I wanted to do. You know, big and small. I wanted to work. Yeah. You know, I wanted to work on Doctor Who. I wanted to, you know, work for Big Finish. I wanted to do a Doctor Who novel. I wanted to yeah. write for tele. All of those sorts of things. Um, I wanted to write a James Bond all film. That, yeah. You know, all of those kind of things that I had in mind. Yeah. And now Quite it's right. much more mm. who I work with is much more of a concern. I want to work with. Mm people i mm. respect and cut creative sparks with um so it's uh, so the work is satisfying um rather than mm. what the things might actually be i think um and yeah yeah and well, if you I can get that right important point to make sorry go on. yeah yeah because the, one of the last things you want to do when there's something, you know, when you're doing something that you've always wanted to do or that you enjoy doing right now because it's it's kind of a hobby and it's turning into your livelihood is for that then to become like a, like a trudge. You don't mm. want it to become like a treadmill, right, where you've just got to churn out content after content after content. And there must be quite a few <coughs> writers and other creatives who fall down into that trap almost and have to kind of fight to get back out of it so i think if you're in a position where you say well, okay i'm going to choose this i'm going to choose that i will work with these people and i think that's the same in anything in life that you do if you can find yourself in a position where you can choose your work so that you enjoy it so that you have a, a pride in it and that other people enjoy it i think there's there's a lot to be said for that and i'm sure there must be a quote in doctor who somewhere which mm. which goes for that Doctor who, Doctor who says I think, when that, he's asked, I think there might be job an entry is. in our book about that somewhere as well. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I'm just having fun. Enjoy your job. Yeah, yeah. I'm just having fun. Indeed. Yeah, that's, that's in waters of Mars, isn't it? What What's your name, rank, and occup and job job op, op, uh, occupation or something, isn't it? You didn't rehearse doctor, that, did you, Jeff? Doctor, no. <laughs> but you know, and he, he says it's why he's behind the you know, camera. Though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But you, you know the bit I mean. Yeah. Um, so I've just got one more question for the pair of you before we uh, wrap up. Um, we suppose it's going to be two now, actually, thinking about it. <laughs> which, which doctor is your favourite to write for? And is there a doctor that you haven't written for that you'd like to? Ooh. That, that's like asking me which of my children I love most. Yep. Um, which I suppose it is. Do you have an answer? Way, really, yeah. um, the, do the doctor that I have enjoyed writing for most yeah um um just because of the nature of the jobs that i've done mm. uh, have been um uh tom baker and david tennant yeah. um, which isn't to say that they're necessarily my favorite doctors it's just those are the jobs i've enjoyed most those are the ones where mm. i i thought i got the the voice right yeah it must um, have been a thrill right for tom baker i think you know just you know, cause yes, yes, that might have been imprudent me, for me to have said that. Now. Doctor, you know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, what about you, Simon? Uh, yeah, I being Tom Baker's producer was pretty exciting. I I produced two lost stories Ooh, that were released earlier yeah. this year. That was, you know, and it wasn't at all what I'd expected. Yeah. I thought he would be quite. Um, you know, he mm. does. He's he's done this for so many years, and he's he's, you know, done so many big finishes and stuff. I thought he'd just come yeah, in and yeah, you know yeah. it'd all be whatever. But he had he had gone through the script. He had notes. He had thoughts. He wanted to discuss it. Really? He was really Excellent. engaged. So yeah. I found myself mm. discussing at quite a deep level how he sees the Doctor and how he should play it and what what the sort of Doctor's thought processes are. Which, to be honest, I would have paid for. Mm. Um, it, that was fascinating mm. um and really 
Yeah. That's brilliant that he's got that passion and care for yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, it was great. Absolutely great. Um I uh, and he was really funny as well and and you know, abrasive but in a funny, yeah. engaging way. So that was great. That was, that was exactly that kind of yeah. creative sparks thing I was talking about. Um Yeah. But otherwise yeah. Favourite doctors and things. I don't. I never get to choose which doctors I write for or companions. Mm. That's always. That's always they oh. come to you with that. That's interesting. But that's yeah. the bit I like. Yeah. Is kind of, you know, come up with a story for these people that they haven't something they haven't done before. Yeah. That's a bit new, that reveals something new about them. That's that's what I'm kind of in it for. That's the bit I yeah. really like. Yeah. You know, it'd be quite nice to cross off some of the doctors I haven't written for, but. Um, you know, I don't. That's it's not my choice. So this time. yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know what you mean. This bad thing. The idea of tying things yeah. together. Uh, I like writing jigsaw stories, mm. which um, connect stuff together, either in a series or just yeah. with with elements of the, of the TV series. Because the balance you want to strike there is mm. you don't want something to be so pedantic that you have to understand the backstory intimately to be able to understand yeah, the story. Yeah. But it's useful mm-hmm. to be able to sort of tie those things together in an interesting mm-hmm. new novel way, which comes up with a, a whole new story. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting because Big Finish does seem to do well. It does do a lot of that, isn't it? You know, pulling almost like pulling things from different eras of Doctor Who, different actors from here, characters from there, characters from everywhere, and let's write a story mm-hmm. about them. You know, and it's, it seems to be more of it than ever now. It's it's mm-hmm. it's huge, it's massive. Well, it's, it certainly does appeal to uh, to a demographic um, that uh, that buy the big finished mm. stories. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and of course we got um, Jodie Whittaker's first um, audio book out, haven't we? Yeah, yes. Yeah, soon as soon. Uh, so we, we think it's fully expecting her to be on Big Finish soon. Mm. Yeah, that'd be nice. That would be, be nice. nice, wouldn't it? <laughs> they're, they're not, they're not giving anything away. <laughs> I need to work on my leading questions I, a little bit more. I, I don't know about Peter. I don't know anything. You know, I, they don't. They don't. Yeah, I've, I've no they, idea. They don't, tell, yeah. they don't tell them anything. Yeah. The only thing, the only things we know yeah. are things that we're working yeah. on at the moment. Um, <laughs> I'm quite right too. Yeah. Quite right too. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you very much for joining us tonight. It's been a pleasure talking yeah, with you. Thank you both. And uh, having a chance to read the book as well and look through that. Yes, you so, did, uh, did Jeff. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there like it is. Cool. There, there's the book that, that uh, everyone else, that has, everyone else has got apart from to, me. Yeah, that's pool. fine. Yeah. I've got my screenshots on my phone. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah, I sent you some, some pictures, didn't I? Yeah. And there, are, there is a sample of it on the BBC website as well. Um, you, you can actually read some of the uh, a sample. Is it one from each of the doctors? Um, I think there's a sample on the on the BBC website, yeah. which you know. Okay. Were, oh, we'll, we'll were were I any kind of professional, I would be able to give you a URL for now. <laughs> but as I'm not, we'll, I can't. <laughs> we'll find it. Don't worry. <laughs> we'll put and it. Um, we look forward to reading Hootopia when it comes out in a definitely, few weeks as well. Simon. Definitely looking forward to that yeah. one. If yeah, you if absolutely. you've been good, no, congrats it's be on good. The, on If you've been good, it's the perfect thing for Christmas. So. Oh, look at that. Yeah, yes. of course. Yeah, Out in time for Christmas. Yeah, yeah that's just brilliant. in time, yeah. Brilliant. <laughs> Simon, Peter, but, thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's been an absolute pleasure and a delight to have you both on and wish you every success as if you need it in all the different <laughs> projects that you're working on now and in the future. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. One, 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 more, one more well. attempt at our, our surname yes. now. <laughs> and Angelides. No. <laughs> Four out of ten. Go, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> well done. And and uh, let me have a go. Angelidis and Guria. Very good. One out of ten. Yeah. Is that right? There you go. All right. <laughs>